Hi all, welcome back for Lakes Part 2. Uh, this is April 1st, 2020. Uh, and if you watch the first lake video, you already understand some of the terminology and things like that. So if you recall, uh, we have some layers that develop in a lake, uh, what we call a thermally stratified lake, especially as it heats up in the summertime in our, in our part of the world. And so we have this idea of an epilimnion and a thermocline and a hypolimnion. Hopefully you know what those terms mean. And we talked a little bit about nitrogen last time. So let's look at phosphorus quickly. So once again, uh, we have our temperature profile here. Pretty typical temperature profile of a thermally stratified lake. And in an oligotrophic lake, Oxygen is pretty much the same all the way down, and phosphorus stays pretty much the same all the way down. PT stands for total phosphorus. P sub S stands for soluble phosphorus in this case. Not true in a eutrophic lake, um, so same, same temperature profile here. But you see, again, oxygen drops off the table for reasons we've already talked about. Phosphorus might be relatively low at the surface, but as phosphorus sinks, uh, as algae die and sink to the bottom, or bits of detritus sink to the bottom, an interesting thing happens. They can get buried in the sediment, and the phosphorus is in the sediment, but in an anoxic condition, so in a low oxygen condition that is down in this part of the lake, um, the phosphorus tends to dissociate with those other particles. In other words, it breaks free. We call it free phosphorus. So you've got a really high level of phosphorus down here in the hypolimnion which is not bothering anyone, except when you get a turnover event, then all this stuff can get washed up to the surface and you get a big algae bloom. So this is called internal phosphorus loading. <clears throat> and the idea of internal phosphorus loading is once you get a lot of phosphorus in a lake, uh, it becomes part of the phytoplankton. They die and sink and they become part of the sediment. The phosphorus is bound to those particles in the sediment. Uh, but in anoxic conditions, uh, it can be released. When oxygen is present, the sediment does a good job of hanging on to most of the phosphorus. But in uh, anoxic conditions, much of the phosphorus is released. It becomes free phosphorus. And then as the lake turnover event happens, it can get washed back up to the surface. So the internal P loading we have here, here's the phosphorus. It gets washed down. It becomes part of the sediment. And then it can get washed back up to the surface during a turnover event. Boy, that's not a very good cycle. There we go, okay, yeah. So that can happen again and again and again. So here's the dilemma. Some of the phosphorus that we loaded into a lake like Lake Erie in the 1960s and 70s is still haunting us because it never really goes away. It keeps getting washed back up to the surface and causing another algae bloom uh, each time there's a fall turnover and a spring turnover very difficult to get rid of uh, phosphorus, that legacy of phosphorus from years ago. So um, what you, I'm hoping that you see is in an oligotrophic lake, this stratification and turnover cycle doesn't cause that much of a deal, big deal, because not that many uh, nutrients or metals um, are washed, uh, are free in the sediment. <clears throat> not that much gets washed back up to the surface. But in a eutrophic lake, it is a big deal because the hypolimnion is loaded with these things. And when a turnover event happens, these things come back up to the surface. Once again, progression from oligotrophic input nutrients to eutrophic um, really changes the character of a lake. And hopefully you're seeing how it's very difficult to say, oh, let's just go back to this because we've got this internal phosphorus loading and maybe we've got some cyanobacteria here that are bringing in extra nitrogen. So this eutrophic lake is loaded with nitrogen and phosphorus year after year after year, and it's really difficult or impossible to bring it back to an oligotrophic state. Okay, let's look at two quick examples of lakes that have some issues, but for different reasons and different sorts of issues. So here's Lake Erie, the good old whipping boy. This is a good uh, poster child for what not to do to a lake. Uh, First thing for you to understand is of all the Great Lakes, it is by far the shallowest. So here's Superior, 1,333 feet deep, and there's Lake Michigan, 750 feet deep, and Lake Huron, sorry, Michigan is 923, and Huron is 750. Uh, here's Ontario, 802, and then here's Little Lake Erie, uh, maybe 200 feet at its deepest in its western basin. It's more like 
uh, maybe 50 feet deep or so in some areas. So it's very shallow. It's surrounded by lots of industry and lots of agriculture and lots of people. So it gets a big phosphorus load. And in fact, that's been part of its problem. <clears throat> so here's some data that shows you a couple of things. One is what's called the Secchi depth. <clears throat> so a very inexpensive way to measure how well light can penetrate into a lake is something called a Secchi disk named after someone called Secchi, I imagine. Um, it's just a little plastic or metal disc. <clears throat> and what you do is you lower it over the side of the boat and you watch it until you can't see it anymore. And then you record the depth. So a really large Secchi depth, you have to be careful how you say that, Secchi depth is good. That means the water is very clear. Water can penetrate really deep into a lake. Um, a really shallow Secchi depth means that it's very turbid or very cloudy water or loaded with algae. So you can see, here's some Secchi readings from Lake Erie uh, back in 1965, pretty shallow. So we're talking about two meters or so. Can't see that disc after two meters. You know, in the 1960s and 70s, Lake Erie was declared a dead lake um, because it was so loaded with pollutants and phosphorus and nitrogen, had so much algae growth and death. There was just no oxygen in it, almost no fish, uh, really loaded. They called it an algae bowl. Um, and almost nothing was living in it. <clears throat> so we had this long legacy of uh, overloading that lake, especially with nutrients. In the 1970s, the Clean Water Act was passed, and that really helped to clean up Lake Erie, although it didn't happen immediately. You can see we had pretty low um, Secchi readings and uh, pretty high. This top graph is showing you loads of phosphorus into the lake, so really, really high loads of phosphorus. Um, in the 1960s and then Clean Water Act kicked in and it, so it did decrease but as the phosphorus load decreased um, the Secchi depth didn't it immediately spring back up. Um, it does eventually it starts getting a little bit deeper here toward maybe five meters or a little deeper that's not so much because of the Clean Water Act it's because the zebra mussel was accidentally introduced into Lake Erie and that's a filter feeder and it filtered out a lot of the algae it made the lake a lot clearer it caused other problems too, but it did clarify the lake somewhat. So um, Lake Erie's had something of a comeback. Um, so the phosphorus load is now below the, the dotted line here that is supposed to be the maximum allowable. Um, and the water has gotten somewhat more clear in, in Lake Erie. <clears throat> Still, we have seasonal algae blooms. Um, and a lot of those are because of that legacy phosphorus, internal phosphorus loading I talked about. And still, we occasionally load too much phosphorus. <clears throat> so this is uh, this graph is showing spring total bioavailable phosphorus load. Um, and even up to 2015, 2016, we're still loading an awful lot of phosphorus into the lake. And we get this sort of situation uh, where, you know, you get this slimy algae growth and um, that's going to die and sink and decompose and take up a lot of the oxygen uh, from the lake. Where does this phosphorus come from? Mostly from farms and fertilizers and manure, a little bit from non-farm fertilizers like people's lawns, septic systems that are leaky, and then other point sources like uh, storm drains and things like that. But mostly it's from the way we do agriculture here in Ohio and Michigan and Canada, and that is we load way too much phosphorus fertilizer on our land and a lot of it washes off into drainage ditches and, and uh, ends up in the streams and ends up in the lake and then um, you can't get rid of it. It keeps cycling year after year after year. So Lake Erie has uh, some, something of a comeback. It's no longer called a dead lake, uh, but it still has a phosphorus legacy problem. Some of the algae that grow in the lake, of course, are toxic algae. That means that they're giving off um, poisons, essentially toxins, um, they have nothing to do with anything except that they are toxic to humans. So you see signs like this along Lake Erie sometimes. You're not supposed to touch the water or certainly not swim in it. Definitely not drink it because it could cause kidney or liver damage, could even kill you. So yeah, you want to stay away uh, from lakes that have this sort of sign. And you see down here in that fine print, uh, these are mostly cyanobacteria or relatives of cyanobacteria. So not only are they toxic, they're also nitrogen fixers. So they're bringing in more nutrient and actually making the problem worse. Really hard to get rid of once they're in a lake. 
Here's another lake in Western Ohio called Grand Lake St. Mary's. It has this, almost every lake in Ohio has this problem because we do so much agriculture and we bleed nutrients. And so you get this sort of slimy, nobody wants to be near this lake. Well, there, there are people that want to be near it. I know some people that live on this lake. I don't know why, but they do. Um, but it's not a good place to swim or fish or wade. Uh, it smells terrible. Um, it's just overloaded. You can see in the map here, a lot of this land is agricultural land. And actually there's a lot of livestock facilities here. So there's, you know, things like manure and um, septic systems that also bleed nutrients into this lake. We'll talk a little bit on Friday about how you try to restore a lake, uh, kind of like we talked about river and stream restoration. Uh, and there are some strategies you can use that sometimes are successful. Okay, let's talk about a different example. This, is, by the way, is all in Chapter 9 in the Protected Land book. You can read about these stories. Uh, this is Lake Tahoe. <clears throat> uh, many of you have probably been to Lake Tahoe. It is an oligotrophic lake, so it doesn't look like Lake Erie at all. Uh, and look at its Secchi readings over the years, going back from 1965, talking about 30 meters here. So Lake Erie was on the order of 2 or 3 meters, and this is 30 meters, so a much clearer lake obviously oligotrophic. You see though, over time from the 1960s, the Secchi depth has been getting shallower. So now we're at maybe uh, 20 meters or so. And the reason might surprise you, it's partially early on because of a lot of new development around Lake Tahoe and a lot of septic systems and things like that, but they fairly quickly diverted their sewage elsewhere so that it wouldn't contaminate the lake. A lot of it has to do with this little critter right here that we'll talk about. So this is a regime shift in a lake for a slightly different reason. First of all, just look at Lake Tahoe's profile compared with some other lakes. Um, it is crazy deep. What do we say? Lake Erie is maybe um, 50 feet deep in some areas uh, on up to maybe a couple hundred feet at its deepest. This is over 1600 feet deep. It's one of the deepest lakes in the world. And so, yeah, it's very oligotrophic. By the way, um, it develops an epilimnion and hypolimnion, but it doesn't really turn over in the same way because it would take so much energy to bring this water up from the bottom. It really doesn't happen. It pretty much stays down there. There's some slight mixing that happens near the surface up here, but in a lake this deep, it really doesn't bring those bottom waters up every year in the same way that Lake Erie does. So it's a very deep lake, very oligotrophic lake. So what's happened in, in Lake Tahoe has been the food web has changed, mostly due to humans. I know you're shocked to hear that, but humans are responsible for this. So here's the historic food web. Uh, there was a fish called the Lahontan cutthroat trout that was the dominant predator in this lake uh, for a long, long time before humans changed things. And then a whole host of smaller fish um, and a really healthy and large population community of zooplankton. Zooplankton are tiny microscopic organisms that eat algae. They're eating the phytoplankton, which are down here. Well, humans uh, came along and changed this. Here's a little timeline of how humans have changed this. Um, <clears throat> we changed it by introducing some fish species that are fun to catch. So uh, rainbow, brook, and brown trout uh, and lake trout all were introduced into this lake so that people could catch them. Crayfish were introduced probably as bait, um, used as bait and accidentally got into the lake and now they're part of the lake food web. They introduced salmon in the 1940s. These are landlocked salmon. Again, the idea here is that they could grow them in Lake Tahoe and then catch them and they still can. They still have landlocked salmon population in Lake Tahoe that's doing pretty well. Meanwhile, down here along the bottom, uh, they fished some native fish to extinction in this lake. So there's the Lahontan cutthroat trout. It was extirpated right around 1940. And then a, a bunch of the other uh, native fish were extirpated in the 1960s. And then Daphnia, which is a, a main zooplankton, was uh, eliminated or near elimination just about by 1980. <clears throat> so uh, they introduced in the 1960s this thing called a mysis shrimp. It's a freshwater shrimp, and they introduced it to become food for the salmon and for these other lake trouts that they wanted to catch and eat or sell. So they thought, ah, this freshwater shrimp would make a great food source for these salmon. Unfortunately, it really didn't. Um, here's a, a close-up picture of it. So this uh, shrimp was introduced into Lake Tahoe to provide a food source for game fish. However, they actually reduced the available food 
by eating a lot of the zooplankton in Lake Tahoe. Because of the way the shrimp migrates, um, it well, was difficult for the fish to find. In fact, it didn't feed the fish very well. It ended up eating a lot of the zooplankton. So we have kind of a top-down trophic cascade happening here. So they introduced this shrimp um, and it ended up, here's the shrimp, I can get my pointer over there. Here's the shrimp they introduce. And it ended up eating most of the other zooplankton in the lake. So there was a real decline in zooplankton. And that meant a real increase in the amount of phytoplankton in the lake. Here's the phytoplankton. So it actually increased the algae in the lake and decreased the secchi depth, made the light penetration shallower. Not so much because of phosphorus loading like we had in Lake Erie, but because of food web changes. So it still is a very clear lake, still a very beautiful lake, and you can see really far down in it. Uh, and it still has a lot of fish. A lot of the fish are different than they were uh, 100 years ago before humans started manipulating it. But once this shrimp is in, you can't really get rid of it. It is part of the food web now, um, and uh, there's no good way to remove it. So uh, Lake Tahoe actually has a little bit of an increasing algae problem because of a food web thing, a top-down thing, not so much because of a bottom-up thing in Lake Erie. So it's an interesting comparison of two ways to change a lake. Okay, so um, that is a good place to stop for today. You do have a lab this week. It's short, um, and I give you instructions on that. It's on uh, Washington State has a water quality atlas website. That's kind of a GIS website, and I give you some a quick tutorial on how to use that and instructions on your lab. That's not due until next Wednesday, so take a look at that. And uh, hopefully you finished your stream lab for today. That's due on Notebook by today. Um, on Friday, we're going to talk a little bit about lake restoration techniques and remediation techniques. Um, and then just to let you know, um, get on the horizon here, since we're into April, you have your third quiz coming up on April 13th. That's a Monday. It's not this coming Monday, but um, I will be explaining that to you next week and giving you a little review sheet and telling you how we're going to do it because it'll be a little bit different than we did in the normal part of the semester. So I hope you're doing well and check out the Lake Lab instructions that are uh, right here on the bulletin also and let me know if you have any questions. Take care.